So, what did the, the, the sort of Eurozone crisis from 2008 onwards, and particularly Greece, tell us about how the EU operates and where its priorities lie? I mean, Greece is a fascinating story. I think around 2011, the EU went from undemocratic to anti-democratic. So what do I mean? Well, it's clearly always suffered from undemocratic kind of values. I think that's an outgrowth of what people have called the functionalist element of the EU. Jean Monnet drove it, right? He said that various crises would allow for the uh, deepening of the EU as a political project. That meant you couldn't really be honest about what it wanted to be from the beginning. The Federalists saying, well, let's have a federal Europe. You know, the, the functionists were saying, we can't really do that, right? Let's leverage crises as they come to basically get the same outcome. The last five years show that hasn't worked, right? So there's always an undemocratic element to it. 2011, in the aftermath of, yes, the global financial crisis, but of course, in a European context, the, um, the Eurozone crisis, the Greek sovereign debt crisis, you have the imposition, effectively by the Troika, right, of the Papademos government onto Greece. Right? They're deciding the governments of member states, effectively. You have something similar happen with Mario Monti the same year in Italy, right, because they were so worried about Berlusconi. So you had the EU after 2011 moving from undemocratic to anti-democratic, choosing, effectively parachuting in governments, right? In the, in the case of Greece, that was intensified even further uh, with the referendum last year. You had the ECB. Now, the ECB is legally obliged to ensure uh, monetary and fiscal stability, right? The ECB was trying to start, effectively, and run on Greek banks during the, the referendum on the third bailout deal, right? They were trying to start a run on banks. Now, why were they doing that? They were trying to undermine public confidence in the Syriza-led government. They were trying to undermine uh, public confidence that there would be a, uh, a calm, stable exit, potentially, of Greece from a set of deals or the EU or the Eurozone. They were being, making it very clear, right? If you don't do as we say, right, there'll be trouble. What will it look like? It'll be catastrophic. Money won't be coming out of the banks, you know? It will look like the 1929 Wall Street crash. And when you've got a fascist party, third in the polls, that really scares people, right? Uh, Yanis Varoufakis, on the day of the vote, called it terrorism. He was calling people around the ECB terrorists. The same guy is now campaigning for a different EU. I mean, you don't get more contradictory thinking from a mainstream politician, to be quite frank. And just to take that point again, Yanis Varoufakis is one of a number of people now who are saying that really the route forward is to reform the EU from within in a sort of pan-global or pan-Europe movement. Uh, how plausible do you think it is that we could get any real sort of fundamental reform of the EU? There's two, there's two things I'd say to that. The first is, why did Britain join the EU? Okay? This thing starts effectively in 1957, Treaty of Rome. Okay? We asked to join in 63, we're not allowed in because of the Gaul, we finally joined in 73. Why did it take Britain so long? Because, here's the explanation, you might disagree with it, this is my personal interpretation, it comes out of the sort of economic analysis. Britain was ensconced within clearly an, an, uh, an imperial trade area, okay? Now what was clear after the mid-50s, really, the late 50s, what was clear was that that was, that was less profitable, right, than what Britain was involved in in terms of trade with Canada or Australia, right? Western European rates of growth, France, Germany, Italy, even Greece, right, Scandinavian countries, Holland, breakneck growth. So what British capitalism wants to do by the mid-60s is that we want to be part of this. This is fantastic. It's a big market, increasingly affluent consumers, really high growth rates for the people who are a part of that. We want to join, right? We want to be a part of it too. They're only allowed to join 10 years later. So Britain was, is in this thing. It's only in this thing, right? Because a certain class of people said we can make more money, we can have better profits in this market than this one. That's the only reason. So take a step back. Why would you care about democratizing it? Why would you care? Why, do, why does it matter? And then people say, well, look, if we democratize it, all the big problems of the 21st century can only be solved through multilateral uh, coalitions. Okay, there's some elements to that. But first of all, that's an argument for world government. If you really believe that, let's have a world government, right? That's not an, that's not an argument for European cooperation. Secondly, look at the 2007, 2008 global financial crisis. How was that resolved? How was that resolved? It was resolved through the G8, the G20, through very loose coordination between member states. The EU, this alleged family, which is so good at cooperating, six years later has the worst, has the worst kind of economic performance of the lot. Worst economic, you know, 
far inferior economic performance than something like the United States, right? So that goes to show that, you know, a big problem, the biggest problem for capitalism arguably since the 1929 Wall Street crash was resolved through nation states cooperating, right? We could do the exact same thing with climate change. Right now we don't because we don't have the nation states, the national governments capable of doing it. Not because the architecture requires, you know, a, a, a democratic EU. I mean, it's just nonsense. So if we want to resolve, if we want to, so if we want to resolve climate change, the refugee crisis, all these things, huge challenges to the 21st century, absolutely. Nation states can do them. We would need to elect uh, very different uh, policy makers. That's the thing that needs to change. We don't need to be a member of a, a free trade area of 500 million consumers. It's just nonsense.